Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames are riding high on a nine-game winning streak, and I'm Dan alongside Matt here to break it all down and talk about what's happened over the last week. Matt, we'll get into these games, but uh, were you expecting, really, when you when you thought about it objectively, were you expecting a nine-game win streak? Well, I did predict that uh, with our previous uh, end-of-show uh, prediction you contest. You did. Um, and frankly, I, I even said at that point, I think this one's going to go into double digits and I still do. Um, the flames next two games are against Winnipeg and Vancouver. And both of those are on the weaker side of the opponents. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it'll be interesting to see, uh, how this team can remain focused, um, and see what Sutter's got in store because like they looked a little less focused against Seattle and it'll be interesting to see let's start with Columbus yep Uh, definitely Calgary Flames played Columbus on February 15th here in the dome of course they're on their month-long homestand and uh opening the scoring for this one was Eric Goodbranson who scored in back-to-back games we also saw the debut of Tyler DeFoley who we'll talk about a little bit later on a line with Monahan and Dubé for this one, and Dan Vladar got his first home start of the year. So lots of uh, lots of I guess first or interesting notes. Yeah, on Flames. and you have to figure that with this game, Columbus was seeking revenge because the 62 shot performance that the Flames threw at them in Columbus a couple weeks ago, you know, they, they got embarrassed. It was a six nothing loss, and you know they did get the revenge. They actually managed to score two this time. And they scored two, but the Flames scored six for the big win in this one. Um, I thought in this one, the set, and I think this has been the story for a lot of this homestand, I felt like the um, the second period was better than the first. I think the Flames have taken a little bit of time to get going. Yeah, I can um, agree with that. You know, it took them a little bit of time to figure out what they're doing, you know, where their place was. Um, and I guess how they wanted to play this game, but they settled in and they forced Columbus to chase the puck a lot in the second. Yeah, and you had to figure that Columbus was going to come out in the first period and give it their all, uh, after, especially after the previous meeting between these teams, and they did. They added a, a relatively effective first period compared to uh, the last one, and then Calgary just broke them frankly broke them is a good way to say it i think um yeah i mean this was we're not used to we've seen a few more of them this past week um and even i'd say this past two weeks but we're not used to calgary winning like you know four one six two that sort of thing so it's nice to see yeah and they're actually capitalizing on their scoring chances and just controlling and dominating the play yeah, I think that's definitely a fair way to say it. Um, we saw in this one, Tyler, and we'll talk more about Tyler DeFoley later on, but Tyler DeFoley got his first Flames goal, 10th of the season, and what a pretty goal that was. Yeah, like that was one of the better goals of the season league-wide, frankly, and just uh, a good way to introduce yourself to the new fans. And, yeah, he played at home, wore number 73, and the fans, I mean, I think that's the first time I've heard the fans do a, a chant of the first and last name of a player. Yeah. Well, it's easy when it's an alliterated name, and, you know, it's it'd be a little awkward of, like, chanting Ja Roma Ginla, you know, like, it just doesn't roll off the tongue, even though, you know, so, like, but Tyler Toffoli, it does, it just has a better cadence and flow. To it, so I mean, it does most, make sense. Most guys play their whole career and don't get a chant like that, and he comes to Calgary and gets his name chant in the first game. That's got to be an awesome wow. I'm I'm happy to be in this market moment. Yeah, exactly. Until Raz gave him a hard time afterwards. But you know, again, and talk, you know, reporters talked to him after the game, and he was saying that Raz gave him a hard time. And the first thing I thought was, "But that's good. That means you're part of the room right away." Yeah, exactly. When you're getting a hard time right away from some of the guys that've been here for a while. It says that you're you're part of the room. Yeah, exactly. You're not being ostracized. 
or even just I don't even know if it's being ostracized, but sometimes it just takes you time to familiarize yourself to new people, new surroundings, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, the next night, uh, the Ducks were in town, and uh, another big win. Exactly the same score as the night before. Another 6-2 victory for the Flames. Lindholm scored twice in this one as the Flames increased their win streak to 8. Um, well, you see, the Flames have been a little repetitive this last week. Uh, they, they won 5-2 against the Leafs. They won 5-2 against the Islanders. 6-2 against Columbus. 6-2 against Anaheim. Now we're, I'm going to pencil it in. We're going to win 2-1 against Winnipeg. There you go. Got to got to duplicate those scores. So whatever we do in Vancouver, we're going to do in Minnesota. Yep. Um, I thought again in this one, the Flames didn't have a great first period. I mean, they, they were okay, but they I don't think they really came alive until the second period in this one. And Anaheim burned our D so many times in the first. Um, I would say that number 25, our goaltender, really bailed us out more than he should have had to in that first period. Yeah, and like uh, it, in the past, like I've mentioned, like how um, you need to fight through this team and then you have to deal with the goalie at the end. And because of the fact that uh, in the first period, uh, the Flames as a whole weren't as sharp, they still had to find a way to beat Markstrom and... You know, that's no easy task for anybody. And it just, it helps so much when, like, the guys were not necessarily feeling it defensively for the first 20 minutes. And then they certainly picked it up after Sonny Milano scored in the first couple minutes of the second period. I'd even say in the third, this team didn't look great. I think they had a really good second frame, and I think they they looked good enough in the third frame, but I think that the second frame is really where this team looked the best. Yeah, well, uh, and you have to figure that after playing against Columbus the night before, yeah. and Anaheim was rested a bit and, you know, the, ready to go, That and it was far more of a desperation game for Anaheim than it was for us. So, like, all those factors, it does make some sense. Yeah, I just you're probably right. I thought the Flames got outworked in the third, and that's probably why. They were probably tired. Yep. Which, um, another... it, that's one of those things that uh, the Flames are just going to have to be mindful of like as like we're moving into March where we're playing four games a week pretty much every week, is that like it's going to be tough. And like they're going to have games where like they're going to have to rely on like two good periods and then holding the fort for the third. Yeah, and also the the stress and strain that comes with going on the road again. Yeah, and like you have to look at like the last couple of games where player defensemen uh, have been hit with pucks, uh, like um, in the first minute of this game, uh, Hannafin got a shot right off the side of the knee, which it didn't knock him out of the game or the one against uh, Seattle, but you know that's a quite a nice bruise that I'm sure that left. I thought in this game, um, the Flames took far too many penalties, and I think that was part of the reason that maybe they were not looking as good as they could be. But uh, at the on the flip side of that, they scored two power play goals. I mean, the Ducks took just as many penalties. They had 15 penalty minutes, and we had 15. And we got two power play goals out of it. So nice to see the power play finally clicking. That's been a bit of yeah. a, an Achilles heel for the Flames. Yeah, and it's like if you're going to have a four minute double minor right at the start of it of the game is basically the best time to have it because nobody has any rhythm yet in the game. The flames are shorthanded for six of the first eight minutes. Yeah. Like that's like the best time because like the other team just won't have like their passing down and all of that. Whereas like those penalties have been taken in the second half of the, first uh, period, then perhaps they might have scored a goal or two. Yeah, I can see that. Um, and then the other note I had here is, uh, this is the fr- I mean, we were talking, you were talking about some of the big scores we've seen, you know, on this homestand. 6 nothing, 5-2, 5-2, 6-2. John Gibson is the first goaltender to get chased from his crease during this uh, homestand. He was removed and replaced with Anthony Stolarz, who looked better but first, I mean, with such high scores, I was surprised when I looked it up that he was the first goalie to to get swapped. Well, it it kind of makes sense. Like the Flames didn't like 
run up the score early in any of the games until this one. Um, like, uh, it w was 4-1 after, like, the first uh, 25 minutes, and, uh, like, if you look at the other games, it was, like, more goals than, like, the last 10 minutes of the game, and by that time, it's like, eh, just leave the guy in there. Yeah, I can, I can see that. I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking back, and you're, you're right. A lot of the, the games, the Flames came alive late. And then the next game on the docket, the f first game ever in the Sal Dome during the regular season for the uh, Seattle Kraken, making their regular season debut in the Sal Dome. And, of course, former Flame Mark Giordano making his, re his uh, return. I thought a really nice video package the team did for him. Um, you could tell that he was probably he was getting emotional about it when you could see him on the ice and all that but great tribute i i think this team always does really good tributes like that i'm i'm always pleased with what we see from the production team oh i agree uh, it's always top notch with them calgary always treats their players right their players and i think you know once a flame always a flame in a lot of ways like even geo i mean he's not our player anymore but you know he was treated really well he was um you know, he was given that, I don't want to say hero's welcome, but, you know, he was very well received, even though he's not our player anymore. Yeah. He was telling a story that he was out for dinner Saturday night, and a whole bunch of fans would come up to him and compliment him on what a great season the Flames were having, and he had to remind people, uh, I don't play for them anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, as, as funny as that is when he tells us, you got to think that's probably a terrible feeling to be having dinner, and people are excited about the team, but almost rubbing it in that, Oh, yeah, you're on a shit team now. Yeah. Enjoy uh, last place. That's right. Um, Flames, this was an interesting game for the Flames here, I think. Like, I, I thought that we saw a lot better Seattle team than their last place record would show. I thought this is a really good defensive Seattle team. Yeah, the, uh, I have to give them full marks for their defense and goaltending. The, getting the puck out of their own zone and into the flame zone, I do not think I have seen a more inept performance by any team at any point in the NHL in my life. And like, how that much was that pathetic. Do you them being inept versus us having a good D? Both, but like it, it's like I, I yeah, like uh, the high danger scoring chances were sixteen to two in the game, and like one was the goal that they scored and the other was like that play with like a minute left in the game and it's like that's not good enough or acceptable at any point and you know like the whole forward group frankly for Seattle should be like not you know like the general manager should not be really looking to retain any of the pieces that they currently have because you know I, like, I think the Vegas shows that they were the anomaly in um in a expansion team and to me this just looks like another expansion team yeah like it's one of those like and i was trying to compare them directly with vegas where like vegas they were the beneficiary of like you have guys that came out like william carlson and uh marcia so that you know like you you can build around those guys with this forward group for seattle like it's all like get whatever prospects and draft picks you can and go sign new people and wait for the prospects to develop. And, you know, like it, it's going to be one of those kinds of rebuilds because like that, that was just bad. And like, from what I've been reading about, uh, from Seattle's fans, like that's basically been their MO all season. So it's not, you know, but again, like, it's to be expected with oh, the expansion true. team. True. It's just, you know, it's not a really acceptable. And, you know, like that. Uh, I'm looking forward to Seattle being at least somewhat competitive. And, you know, it's just, it's. I get frustrated when, like, new teams or, like, if they're relocated. Like, it, it doesn't really set the franchise up for success if they're, like, a, like extremely bad. And, like, that forward performance, like, that was extremely bad. <laughs> I, 
I wasn't sure what to make of the Flames' first period. I didn't know if it was just a really good Seattle defense or if the Flames were playing down to their opponents. But for the first two periods, I just didn't think that we saw... I mean, we saw some great chances in front, and I think we got to give Grubauer a lot of credit. He looked really good in this game, better than he probably should have, but I felt like the Flames didn't have the same offensive spark we've seen the last couple weeks. Like, frankly, if they had got a couple of the bounces that they've had go in um like the wide open nets like if they had connected there on were a two, few of those for sure you know like if they connected on two of them like then you know like this is a moot point it, but they had like five or six in the game and none of them connected it, it, that's just more bad luck than anything it, and Grubauer did stand on his head and you know like that was a Vesna caliber performance by Grubauer and like if they the Flames were facing a, even an average or above average goaltender like that the score would have been 5 or 6-1 yeah I think that's fair and you know Daryl Sutter was asked afterwards uh, in the media availability about you know the Flames ability to win in different ways we've seen them win the big games now we've seen them grind out that win against this team and he was very complimentary of the defensive system we're seeing in Seattle and thinks they just haven't done as well because they didn't get good goaltending but you know I think he's right though this is it's important for the Flames to be able to win in a lot of different ways against a lot of teams and sometimes you've got to have those grind out games where you're winning by one or two and still being able to not get frustrated and just you know play your game and grind it out yeah, and you saw that throughout the third period. Like, even like after Lindholm scored to give us the lead, the team just kept putting the pressure on. They weren't connecting, but they just kept doing like all the routine things and not like collapsing into a defensive shell or anything and letting Seattle dictate the play. They just kept playing their game and playing their game and playing their game, and the clock just burned down until the last minute or so when Seattle actually did have a chance or two and that was it but I was yeah I think it was a it was probably a good game maybe not what we expected I, th- I think the expectation was higher considering the last five games before that but yeah. if the Flames hadn't been winning in such a a dominant Thorough. fashion yeah <laughs> you know I, I think that this is probably about what you would have expected from these two teams yeah more or less like probably another goal or two our way but yeah and like frankly you know the score being 2-1 like how many times have we played say like Arizona before uh when like they were actually getting good goaltending um in like the Mike Smith era and you know the Flames would win 2-1 and it would basically be like this game where Calgary had just run all over them, but the goalie bailed them out. And, you know, it games like this happen. And, you, you know, Calgary found the way to win, and that's they got the two points. They moved four up on Vegas. That's the important thing. And nine wins in a row, as you mentioned. Two points up on Vegas now. The Flames are riding a nine-game win streak, which puts them number one in the Pacific. They have two games in hand on Vegas. The Flames are currently 29-13-6 and six for 64 total points. Vegas has played 50 games, star 48, and they're 28-18-4 and four for 60 points. So we finally caught up with... I mean, not quite, but I'd say, you know, with uh, us and San Jose and Edmonton all kind of being that 48-49 range, we've caught up and we're number one in the Pacific, which also now puts us ninth in the league um, and second in the West. Yeah, and frankly, um, I also have to kind of put like a little caveat in the fact that like so many Eastern teams are above the Flames, like seven of them are ahead of Calgary just because of the fact that like every team in the east that's outside the playoffs is absolutely terrible and it's like they're all basically Seattle bad pretty much with only a couple of exceptions and you know like of course the good teams are going to be feasting on the bad teams so I think that all of their point totals are a little bit inflated just because of that and that's fair and you know i mean 
Sometimes you win things just because the stars line up. And I feel like if the Flames go deep this year, it could just be because the stars line up. Because we're in a, you know, Western Conference that, you know, maybe isn't as strong. We have some weaker opponents. Like, I feel like, you know, it just could be the year that everything lines up and the Flames the Flames go further because of it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, you know, like, frankly, like, I think Colorado and Calgary are best situated to make a deeper run just because of the caliber of opponents that they'll face in the postseason. I think that's a fair, fair statement. Well, Matt, with, uh, with the week recapped, I guess we have to talk about the biggest news story, and that was less than 24 hours after you and I stopped the recording last week, we talked about maybe the Flames should bring in Tyler Toffoli, and as though the general manager has hacked our lines and listening to us before the show goes live, he decided to make that trade. Uh, actually, we just bugged his office. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> if, have you ever seen Matt sitting outside the cell dome with a tin can to his ear? That's what he's trying to do, is listen to the GM's office? Yep. He's our man on the street. So this, and, and I want to make sure I get this right, because uh, there's a lot of pieces going this way. The Montreal Canadiens traded Tyler Toffoli to the Calgary Flames for a 2022 top 10 protected first round pick, meaning that if the Flames somehow drop into the top 10 picks uh, in the draft. It's more uh, that if the Flames miss the playoffs and win the draft lottery is, I think, what the caveat is really. Because like, they're not going to fall into the bottom 10, but they could hypothetically miss be like the last team I guess that's true, and yeah. then win the the draft lottery and then it's like well that's not fair <laughs> so if that happens then uh, Montreal will not get this year's pick and they'll get next year's first round pick in 2023 they also get unsigned prospect Emil Heinemann who you may not know that name if you follow Flames drafts he actually came to us from Florida as part of the Sam Bennett trade a 2023 fifth round pick and right wing Tyler Pitlick yeah so Pitlick was in this deal basically just for cap reasons because his $1.75 million just helps to shave Toffoli's deal down for this season. It sh- it helps shave Toffoli's deal down. It just it also brings gets us some cap room, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, I mean, Pitlick really hasn't – I don't think he's played for us since December, so – yeah, you know, we even it, talked it's about one of those last year, uh, that, or last week. Um, Treliving actually mentioned that uh, he got hurt in the first game of the preseason, and it just things have spiraled basically for him, and that's pretty much why he was not as effective. And sometimes that just happens where everything kind of screws up for you in a season, and un- unfortunately for him, it's his first season with a new team, and like we were remarking like this wasn't the same player that we saw in Arizona last week, and yeah, there's reasons for that, And but now he's a member of Montreal with his cousin, and yeah. Um, so now the Flames have Tyler Toffoli, which is acceptable. So Matt, when you look at what the Flames gave up here, do you think this is a reasonable return? Do you think they paid too much? Well, the way I look at it is that um, Emil Heinemann, he's looking just based off of how he's performing, that like if he makes the NHL, he'll be more of a third, fourth line type guy. Um, and he did not seem to be overly enthusiastic about getting traded to Calgary. Uh, and for living, when he made the trade announcement said unsigned prospect Emil Heinemann which kind of indicates that you know there might have been a little bit of friction there um and the fifth round pick is kind of an irrelevancy so realistically the main asset that went to Montreal was the first round pick and like right now that would be like the 23rd overall selection if so uh, really if you if you break this down, we paid a fourth round pick for Pitlick. So really we gave up a first, a fourth, a fifth, Heinemann, and that was the deal. Yeah. And you look at uh, Toffoli, he has two more years at like four and a quarter million a season. And uh, like you remember back when the Flames traded for Travis Hamanick and like they paid the premium uh, for the good cap hit. Frankly, Calgary got the player for the right price, and the 
cheap cap hit is like an added bonus on top of it. So, you know, because the way Toffoli has played since he's been with Montreal, like, he is not a $4 million player. He's more like a 6 7 $8 million player. So, you know, that works very well for us where, you know, like how the Flames have guys like Lindholm and Hannafin and Anderson on relative bargain contracts that now you've got another guy who's on a relative bargain contract for next season, which helps to make things a little bit more manageable on all fronts. I think that the price paid for Tyler Toffoli, in my opinion, was reasonable. The way I look at this is, you know what, we gave up the first, and you'd mentioned last week you'd be disappointed if the Flames had that first, you know, coming out of the deadline. Um, I look at Heinemann almost as a free asset. I mean, if you look at it, we gave a sixth and Bennett for a second and uh, Heinemann. So I kind of look at that as, you know, f- free a free asset to give away. That yeah. fifth, like you said, is inconsequential. And what's Pitlick done for us? So, yeah, I mean, really, when, when I look at this, it's a first and, I guess, Heinemann are the two real assets here. I don't think Pitlick was probably going to be re-signed next year anyways. So if we look at you know, what we know the Flames can do in the draft and some of the guys in the system. Were we looking at Pitlick as being a guy that had a long-term future here? Probably, Probably not, not. And even if he ever signed. So it's not like we've given up a Connor Zari or a Peltier or someone like that. You know, I think that this was a, I think this is an acceptable price to pay for a hockey deal. If it was a rental deal, I think it'd be rich. But for yeah. a hockey deal that'll keep us two, three years in the roster, I think it's acceptable. Yeah, like, if um, this had been a rental, I think the first would have been one of the two seconds. Yeah, I can see that. You know. And and I think that would have had to be it. Like, I, I think if you're, even if you're doing the second plus all those assets, you're giving up far too much for 30 yeah. games. Well, like, even if it was a second, the fifth, a lesser prospect than Heinemann, uh, you know, like, the equivalent of, like, a fourth type of thing. And, and uh, pit like just for cap reasons, I think that would have been more appropriate. But you know, because you know, like frankly, like Toffoli now becomes a core piece to this team for the next few years. Like that's, uh, you know, get for what's tantamount to a late first round pick and possibly like a bottom round pick if the Flames go on a run. Like if they're one of the final four teams standing then, you know, like, that's pick number 28, 29, or 29, 30, 31, or 32. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, like... And we have to be honest, even if they made that pick, that pick would not be realized at the NHL level for probably four or five years. Yeah. So, like, you know, Well, look at, like, uh, Peltier. Like, we selected him three years ago, and he's just now getting to the point where he might make the lineup maybe this season or next year. Like yeah. and you're looking at that same kind of timeline and like, frankly, like that's too far away from where this team is currently. Like we're competing now for a cup now, so. And to me, this trade signals these guys are all in. Yeah, and as they should be. Our division is frankly trash. Like there, there is Vegas is the semi good team besides Calgary. And they have a lot of holes in their divi- or in their team, and like all of the other teams are just bad uh, for various reasons. Not necessarily going to remain bad, like LA and Anaheim are on the upswing, but you know, like this is basically the era where Calgary can kind of pencil themselves in as first or second in this division for like the next two or three years. You have to take advantage of the shots that you get, and you know, Calgary should be all in and should be the contending team in this division and the team to inspire fear in opponents, not, you know, like, oh, they're there. Are you surprised we're able to get to Foley without altering our NHL roster? No. I thought it would have taken at least one roster player. Uh, It's not what Montreal is looking for. Like, if you're talking like another team that's kind of, not like a, in complete teardown mode like Montreal is. Like they're basically gonna be going the Ottawa route of burn the whole thing to the ground and go from there. Um, 
you know, most other teams kind of like partially rebuild and partially keep their team together. If it was one of those teams, then I think you might have seen Dubé as a piece or something along those lines or Valimaki like we discussed. But because uh, Montreal's just like, give us your prospects, give us your picks, and, you know, <laughs> we're already dead, so yeah. here, take our, you know, anything we got. <laughs> the other interesting thing about Toffoli is how much of this roster he already knows. He's working with the coach he most credits for his development, Daryl Sutter. He has close friends, uh, Brad Richardson, Trevor Lewis, and Milan Lucic. And I think everyone's now probably seen that uh, picture of him at Disneyland with Lucic and his family, former junior roommate Sean Monahan, as well as former Canucks teammates Markstrom and Tanev. So, I mean, he knows so much of this team already, which I think is going to make him fit in well. And we're already seeing him on a line with his former junior roommate Sean Monahan. Um, do you think that's do you think that's where we'll see him long term, or do you think he'll move up the lineup? Well, part of the thing is is that because of the fact that the Eat Bread, Backland, and Coleman line and the Gaudreau line have been just rolling over everybody. For those that don't it, know who that nickname may be, that's Andrew Mongepani is Eat Bread. That, you know, uh, like those guys are just massacring everybody. You you don't touch hot lines at all. <laughs> and you wait until the they cool off and then you can tinker. And so... Basically, your options were to put uh, Toffoli with Lucic and Ruzitska on the fourth line, or with Dubé and Monaghan. And to me, they're like there's really only one option at that yeah. point. I agree. You're not going to change the first line. Goudreau, Lindholm, Gachuk. That line's clicking. Like you said, there's a lot of chemistry. And what I'm now here being uh, hearing being called the ABC line for Andrew Backlund and Coleman. So really, Dubé, Monaghan is the place to put to Foley. And, you know, if, I mean, you might say, well, we paid a lot for a third line guy, but I look at that if you can get those top three lines rolling, that becomes a very hard well, and forward that, that's group the to thing. defend like, against. Uh, so in three games, those guys on that third line have three goals. Mm -hmm. and now, you know, the thing is, is that if, you're trying to defend this team, you're going to be throwing your best pairing at Goudreau's line and your second best pairing at Mangiapane's line. So, Toffoli has been basically a point-per-game player over the last 18 games with Montreal. Uh, he had 17 points in his last 18 with them. It, he's come here, and he only has one point in the three games, but, you know, he's helped the other guys be more confident, and... You know, I think they have six points between them now. Like, that's, uh, you know, like a, a huge departure, frankly, from Richie, where, like, those guys weren't contributing other than Monahan on the power play. So, you know, if you get those guys being able to take advantage of the other team's third pairing, you know, a, a, like a guy like Toffoli, he can score on the first pairing guys. So if you, he's getting to feast on the third pairing guys, then hey, you know, that's just free money basically. And, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see. And, like, would I be shocked if, like, after a while, like, Mangiapane's line with uh, Backlund and Coleman s slows down a bit, that you perhaps see Backlund and Coleman get slotted with Dubé instead and the other two guys up with Mangiapane? Definite possibility. See, but, I don't even know if I change the lines or just change the ice time allotments. Well, and that's the thing. Like, there are plenty of options for Daryl to play around with. And, like, with the, them getting to fully so early in the season, it allows them plenty of time to allow uh, to fully to acclimate to Calgary, um, even just to the air in Calgary, because, you know, it's a lot thinner. The altitude, it, yeah. You know, like all of those things get situated, not having to worry about being and needing to be the guy right now, and you know, let every all the chips fall for like the next few weeks, and then see how th and reevaluate then. And you know. I think bringing him in on what is now our third line is a smart idea. Like you said, we're bringing him in early enough that we have time to sort of let him acclimate here, and it gives him that time to say, okay. What is his role? And let's not stick him right into a high-pressure situation, but let him get to know what's expected, get used to these guys, and give him a, a scenario where maybe there's not as many expectations on him. 
Yeah, because like, it, could you imagine just the pressure coming in here if he got slotted on Gaudreau's line? Like, all of a sudden, you're playing with unfamiliar people, and like, if we don't score in this game, then we're probably going to lose, and then that's going to be my fault because I'm disrupting things. Instead, he can just slot in on the third line, figure things out, and contribute when and where possible. Again, his line is a goal a game since he's been here. You know, like, all of those things help and make a huge difference. And, you know, then when the time comes, you know, you can slot him up on the lineup or down or whatever and move everybody around if need be. And, and you know, I there... Think he could be the guy to get Monaghan going again. Yeah, exactly. And Monaghan had a couple of assists in the Duck game. And, you know, Dubé had a goal against both Columbus and Anaheim. Like, that, that's a very helpful thing. And, you know, it, like, just as important, frankly, to get those guys going. Because it's been tough, uh, you know, and not, not to disparage Brett Ritchie. Like, he's done as good as he can. It's just that, you know, it's just like last year when Gaudreau and Monaghan had insert miscellaneous, you know, no-name player here. Which I think at one point was Brett Ritchie. Yeah, um, it you know it's hard to generate offense when you're you have a guy that's not at the same skill level, and now like Dubé and Monahan have somebody who's right at their skill level or higher, and so now like they don't have to be the guy on the line, like they can all be the guy on the line and you know play off of each other instead of needing to take everything upon themselves which it's interesting when you're mentioning you know a guy of the same skill level and this got me thinking this week when i look at that line of monahan to foley and dubé in some ways dubé feels like he's the odd man out there it feels like if we're going to go out and get a depth forward between now and the trade deadline you'd almost be getting a guy i think to slot in the left wing of that line with the foley and monahan maybe more of a veteran guy and that would probably then move Dubé down with Lucic and Rujishka. Well, and that's where, uh, like, why I mentioned, like, possibly uh, swapping um, Manjapane and Dubé um, and having, like, those three be the skilled guys. Because, frankly, Backlund and Coleman can play with anybody and play a respectable two-way game and be Backlund and Coleman. Like, you're not going to get anything different from those guys because they're very good at what they do game in game out um and it like if you get that depth guy you know like i'm just gonna throw out a name just because you know we just played them Callie Yarncroc. if you got him and threw him on the left wing in dubé spot like that would basically be perfect and you know then dubé can slot in on the fourth line or be out of the lineup for a veteran guy instead I think a, a younger guy like Dubé, you want to keep playing even on the fourth line because it keeps uh, him going and, talking, it gives you, and it yeah. gives you that depth. I'm talking more like playoff time because sometimes you might see Dubé slot out uh, in that case. Okay, yeah, playoffs maybe, but I think during the regular yeah. season you'd want to keep him going so he's ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if somebody gets banged up, he's ready to go. Not everybody's like Michael Stone where they can play once every 365 days and be ready to play. And I scored. Yay, now I'm good. Bye, good night. <laughs> That's right. Okay, I had my one game. I made my 750000 See you guys next year. Yep. Um, because of this deal, the Flames have now taken on some cap in a, in, an, in a time when I think there's some cap uncertainty with this team. A lot of big contracts are going to have to sign. A lot of guys, they're going to need some money here. Do you think that the... Tyler DeFoley signing is going to impact their ability to sign the big four. And I'd say that's Kachuk, uh, Goudreau, Monaghan, and Shillington in the offseason. Yeah, Manjapane and Shillington. Or, but sorry, yeah. Manjapane, yeah. Um, no and yes and no. Sorry, um, they, I think it's a Monaghan because they, they may have to move that deal. But Yeah, and th that's where... Because Toffoli is such a good dollar for player contract that, you know, like frankly give me as many of those as you can <laughs> you know so just just on that just in relation for fans that don't know we are paying blake coleman 4.9 million elias lindholm 4.85 million and tyler defoli 4.25 million go ahead matt yeah exactly and it's one of those things where like with both 
frankly, Coleman and Lindholm, like we're getting value or, you know, and especially in Lindholm's case, plus plus. And, uh, you know, like if you look at, say, a player like Michael Backlund, say like Sean Monaghan, say like Milan Lucic, all three of those guys are movable. And like, especially Lucic with his good season this year, teams will, you know, like there's only, I think, one year left on Lucic's contract. That that instantly becomes a serviceable contract. You know, like, it, yeah, over uh, overpaid slightly, but doable for one year. And the interesting thing about his deal is, while it's a $6 million cap hit, it's only 800000 in real money. So you could find a team that just needs to get to the cap floor, doesn't want to pay a lot of real dollars to, I think, take that on. Yeah, calling Arizona. But, um, yeah, I mean, Arizona, potentially even Seattle next year. Yeah, and, you know, like, as much as, like, you don't want to trade Lucic because he has been a valuable player, it, like, yes, the Flames are technically, uh, to borrow a phrase from uh, Jay Feaster, in cap jail, but yet they're not. And like they are you... on paper now, but they have. I mean, if they can move Lucic and Monahan, they free up eleven million dollars. Yeah, it, or even Backlund. You know, because like, how would you say? I'm still not convinced that like Monahan's current level of play is permanent. And you know, uh, with how important he's been, I'd rather give him a benefit of the doubt. But, and I think that, and I think that's the only reason I could see them moving Monahan. Is Monahan has two years, including this year. Backlund has three, so I think the Backlund deal might be harder to move. Uh, not as not really. Um, Backlund is a full value four dollar contract, so it's not like a guy who's being paid, overpaid by two million dollars. Like Backlund is worth what the, he's getting paid, the reason so. i could see back on moving is he's 32 it'll be 35 when the deal's over monahan is 27 so if i'm looking at that i'd almost rather keep the 27 year old but you've got to make sure that he doesn't want a lot more money and i think there's an argument to be made that he doesn't get much of a raise yeah well and like that's where like uh to bring it back a little bit um like targeting a guy like cal yarncrock for example He's not a very expensive player, and he would definitely be able to fit as a third line center on this team moving forward. And, like, this is one of those times where you could shop for now and the future with the trade deadline. And I think that the Flames need to be looking at guys that you could potentially replace what Backlund brings for the most part cheaper. But cheaper. And, uh, you know, because it's, how would you say, like, if Monaghan rebounds into the player he's been, that's a huge deal. And where Backlund is, has been this guy, but consistently for his entire career, you, you know, it's a lot easier to replace Backlund with the lesser version of than it is to find yeah. another well Monaghan. If. When I look at the when I look at the lineup, I like Goudreau, Lindholm, Gachuk number one. I like Mangiapane, Coleman too, but I think you can change the centerman there. But I well, think like, now it, with yeah, like, Monahan to Foley, you don't you want to keep those two together as well if you can. Yeah, and like that's where like potentially next year, like you could see like the breakdown being uh, Mangiapane with Monahan and to Foley as your second line, and then your third line being uh, like a guy like Dubé. A Cali Yarncroak or equivalent guy as your center, and then like Ruzitska or Peltier or you know a free agent signing or something on the right side of that for your third line, and then you know insert whomever prospects, young players, veteran guys, whatever on your fourth line, and basically be on an equivalent talent level but just cycling some of the names and making all the dollars work. And I think if you're going shopping in the summer for a third line center, you can do that fairly affordably as well. I mean, yeah. you don't need to, you don't, you're not going to need to break the bank to get that guy. And especially if this team's successful, I can see some guys, you know, wanting to come here and play. Oh, that for role. sure. Like if the flames say make the cup finals, it, instantly like the flames become the place to be. And you know, especially with like the whole makeup of the team you have Daryl behind the bench 
you know, like players will be, you know, like Calgary will be at like one of the top three destinations at that point. I know, and we, yeah, I, I, I know what you're saying. I think that there's still some agents that are going to persuade players that maybe this isn't the best building, isn't best training facilities, which I know is already happening. But yeah, I think it definitely helps boost our, our, you know, level of where guys want to go. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think that you know. I, I think that the Flames are taking a bit of a gamble of getting that cost certainty with Toffoli and kicking the how are we going to deal with it down the road six months as opposed to saying, let's bring in a rental and then try to shop free agency for that guy and maybe it ends up costing two, three, four million more. Um, yeah, and like that's why like I wouldn't be surprised if the Flames, like if they pull another deal for insert third line guy here, if it's another guy with... Uh, term on his contract that they can keep in the lineup for relatively cheap for a while yeah my only worry is the term costs to acquire so even if it's a guy that is a you know is a free agent hopefully then as you said you can convince him to come back and if not you can easily replace that third line with somebody else down the road i don't think it has to be the team that we enter the playoffs with is the team we start next season with yeah i agree so with the acquisition of Tyler Toffoli, this team now has been looking really good this month, and we now have the Flames on a nine-game win streak, which is uh, quite impressive. The best win streak from this team is 10 games. They've done it at least twice, uh, once when they were in Atlanta and then once in 2017. And it, the Flames, I mean, it looks like they might be going to 10 games here. You thought this could go double digits, Matt. Realistically, looking at the schedule without you know getting into our predictions for the week, um, how like what's realistic? How far do you think this team's going to go? Frankly, like with uh, them playing um, Winnipeg, who's all right, and uh, Vancouver, who's all right, they both have fifty-two points. Um, they're both the uh, fifth and sixth worst teams in the West. You know, kind of below the playoff teams or the potential playoff teams, but not like desperately bad. The Flames should, you know, like if they're playing at the same level that they have been, they should be able to beat both of them. Then they play the first actual tough opponent, which is the Minnesota Wild, on a back-to-back. And that's not, where... Not really a back-to-back. There's uh, 26, and then they have two decades off, and they play them on the first. So yeah. they play them twice in a row, but not what we'd call a back-to-back in the NHL. True. Um it's uh one of those where uh, a home and home series yeah uh that would be where uh you know if the flames are going to you know have the streak snapped uh that would be more where you'd expect it but uh again the flames have been playing so well that you know it, it, it frankly who knows like if they get through those two minnesota games then they play the worst team in the nhl the montreal canadians then the best team in the west so you know the this game could street could stop against winnipeg it could run all the way through to colorado frankly it's up in the air and you know this team one of the things that i've seen with daryl uh like especially in the post game press conferences is just like the trying to make sure that the guys are returning to Mm -hmm. attention to detail every time like yeah you might be absolutely kicking the ever-loving crap out of a team you don't want to let it get to your head yeah okay yeah you did great that's awesome um the next night you're playing somebody else who has a completely separate motivation system everything you know they're not coming off of loss or this or that or whatever they've got their own set of things you have to go beat them now and the ability to reset themselves is the i think one of the main reasons why they've been able to push it to nine thus far being in the media lounge and being in some of those discussions with daryl after the last couple games the thing i really like about him is he's He's very good at being complimentary of his opponents. You don't want to make it seem like you've beaten a, you know, a crummy team because then what did you actually do? And I think, you know, Daryl's very good at saying to these guys, you know, this team was good at X and we beat them. Now it's an accomplishment. Yeah. 
Well, and that's the thing. Like every team in the NHL can beat every anybody other team. can beat anybody else in any given night. You know, you just need the like. Look at Grubauer. Like he almost stole two points for Seattle yesterday. Mm-hmm. And you know, if Seattle had forwards that could actually play in an offensive system, they might have. But you know, um, it's one of those things where Calgary they need to not get their head above where they are and i think that's been part of their problem is that oh well we just beat vegas and toronto so therefore we should be able to beat the new york islanders and then they lose six to one you know and it's one of those where you know them being able to okay yeah we beat those two teams that were good and now we're playing a lesser team and being able to reset and go and beat them too and kind of want to forget about the streak and just look at the game in front of you yeah exactly and like winnipeg they're a decently talented team and they can beat you if they have a good goalie you have to work hard and like winnipeg's had it out for us over the you know since we beat them in that playoff series so you know it's one of those things that like you have to be at the top of your game for this one and then, and i mean you know let's be honest the flames will lose again at some point this oh, is yeah, not going to last sure. the rest of the season and i think the big question is and we've talked about this a lot in the past when they lose how do you rebound after that do you feel bad and you know feel sorry for yourself for two three games or do you pick it up brush it off and move on and to me when this the longest win streak in the NHL is 17 games for the Pittsburgh Penguins. We're not going to make it 17 games. So I think it's good that we're racking up the points now. It gives you a bit of a buffer. And we will fall on probably a 3-4 game losing streak at some point again. And it's just a matter of, you know, making sure you're winning more than you're losing. Yeah, like especially like in the second week of March. Like you have Washington, Tampa, Detroit, and Colorado. And the two games prior to that a Colorado game like it, that's going to be a tough stretch for this team thankfully and, those are all home games and that softens the blow a little bit yeah and so like it it's one of those things that you know like Calgary is going to you know like get as many damn points as you can but like you're going to face adversity again and you know with playing every other game every other day and you know back to backs in there like this team's going to get tired and it they're going to get banged up and like I'm sure that guys like Peltier and Phillips are going to be making their NHL debut at some point because of injuries and you know like that's just natural and I wouldn't be shocked if Valimaki and Shinvaler appeared as well same reason Uh, and it's one of those things and you know Calgary needs to be able to fly high while they can and then be able to like okay we lost against X okay who who are we up against next and reset okay let's go kick their butt now yeah and I, I guess you know I mean it's it's about how they're playing and I don't think that we you know I don't think that any of us looked at this homestand and said they're going to win them all and I mean that's looking very you know very likely at this point so I think it's just a matter of sort of like you said don't let it get to your head let these guys play one game at a time and go from there and try to forget about what's happened try not to get you know a big head out of this um and yeah, yeah hopefully and they, saw hopefully that, they, can, uh, they but, can move forward and and i think you've got to respect the lesser opponents and i think that's one thing that maybe they haven't done as well in the past is they've gone into some of these games saying you know what these guys are not good and they've played down to them and i think you've got to respect every team yeah and like if you look at like the first couple months of the season like the flames were basically like even when they lost games were able to rebound fairly shortly thereafter and go and take it to the opponents and like re-get on that horse without it getting too drastic and then COVID hit and that was kind of its own little ordeal uh for a while there but you know uh, like now like Calgary's back on the horse again and it'll be interesting especially like when things do go awry uh how they reset like is it gonna be more like the first couple of months where okay yeah they lost a game or two and then they won again and they're back to winning again and you know i just but, don't want fans to think that when they eventually lose that this team's no longer any good they you know they're gonna lose at some point it's inevitable yeah 
And they're going to probably face a period here where they go three, four losses. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, you know, like, frankly, with, uh, like, they have, what, uh, 40, 34 games left? Something like that? Roughly, yeah. Yeah, 34. Um, you know, like, if they go, uh, like, say, 22 and 12, like, they'll win the division handily. You know, and, like, that's 12 losses in that span, but, you know, that more than doable. 36. Okay. There you go. They played 48 games. So, yeah, I think it's just a matter of tempering our expectations that, you know, I mean, it's, we're flying high now and it feels good, but it's going to come to an end at some point. It's going to be a matter of how the Flames continue their season. The best teams lose games, and we can't exp- – I don't think we can expect this to go much past – this weekend it's been fun but i don't think we can expect to go much past the end of february yeah like uh, you know in order to tie the net, uh, nhl record they they'd have to beat minnesota both times colorado and wa- washington and the edmonton oilers like you know and it, then and then the the kickers there okay so you've tied the record now to to beat the record you got to beat tampa bay yeah <laughs> Exactly, like, it, like what? What a final boss! Like, if you get there, yeah. What a final boss to the the NHL record. Yeah, the two time defending Stanley Cup champions. Bring it, you know, like yeah, like it's not. Gonna and that's happen. when I could see them doing like a ten ga- or a seventeen game win streak, and then they lose to Tampa like eight one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, something along those lines. It's like yeah, you know, like they just get lit up, and it's like wow, you guys had your fun. Now let the adults play. Like, yeah. Uh, like it, it, it's not gonna happen at all, and you know, like, I, would I be shocked if like the game, uh, game against uh, Winnipeg ends up in a loss? No, uh, like, frankly, like Winnipeg, they beat the Flames four to two earlier this season. It's an afternoon game. The Flames have played a lot lately, and, and I think now, now with the win streak, if I'm the coach of any of these teams, if I'm the coach of Winnipeg, Vancouver, Minnesota, I'm saying. You guys want to be the ones to end this. Like, I think it could be a motivation for me as well. Oh, for sure. And, you know, like, hey, you can be the team that ended their nine-game win streak or ten-game win streak or whatever. It, yeah. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see exactly, like, how uh, this team, you know, because, like, now they're, like, one off the franchise record. So, like, that's a bit of pressure, frankly. And it's like, hey, can we match that? And then, you know... If they do, then can we beat that? And then can we extend it? And, 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 and it'll be interesting to see. Well, Matt, the last uh, topic for this week, and this is something that I saw a lot coming up on social media yesterday with the return of Mark Giordano to Calgary, is the Flames, as we know, have not named a captain. They have some alternates this year, but no captain. Do you think that the Flames need to name a captain before a playoff run? Do you think they need to establish a leader for this year? Uh, they have a leader, and his name is Daryl Sutter. And he is the captain. You could put a C on a jersey. Daryl's the captain. Can we put a, Can we give him like a C on his suit jacket? Yeah, sure. You know, that his uh, handkerchief and his uh, suit square. jacket. Yeah, exactly. You can put the C on that. We'll put a C on his face mask. Yep. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I didn't think of it that way till you said that, but I think that's a good way of saying it is Daryl is the captain this year. Daryl's the one who's, who's you know, come in and got these guys playing a certain way, and I think really we've put Daryl Sutter players in here to help spread the message. But, yeah, I totally agree with you when you mentioned it. I think Daryl Sutter is the captain. Yeah, and, well, you look at, like, uh, from player interviews and all of that, everybody sounds like Daryl. They they're brought all, into the system totally. Yeah, their their approach in the game. You look at how Johnny Gaudreau's playing. He is playing like a Daryl Sutter player. He is playing a very good tight defensive style, and you know hot run gun offense as well. And you know like uh, everybody from Gaudreau all the way down, everybody to a man is bought in one hundred percent. You know everybody is Daryl Sutter. <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, it's it's a good way to say it. I think you're right. Daryl's really become the leader of this team, and I think we even felt that last year when he got hired. I mean, I can't remember the last time in any market that there's been so much excitement for a coach. Uh, non-existent, really. 
Like everybody's like, "Oh, who's that guy?" <laughs> Basically, or it's just, or it's just another coach. Yeah. Or and it, um, even if it's somebody that like you've liked as a coach, like say like the Leafs with Pat Quinn, you know, like yeah, and <laughs> you know, and, you know, and I was having this discussion with someone last night on Twitter through the Fireside Chat account at Fireside Podcast, and I said, "Take a look at the ice. You've got 18 players who all wore a C. I mean, everyone on this team's got a C on their chest, and I think, really, I think that the leadership has come from everybody, and I think not having that." one voice or not having that one guy in the locker room who's doing that. I think it's made everybody rise to the occasion. And I think everybody's sort of trying to show that they can be the leader. And I think this is really the year to figure out who is good. I don't think you can go next year without a captain, but I think this is really a year to kind of see who's going to rise to that occasion. Yeah. And you look at like uh, just even the response from the players on the ice, Like, in years, look at last year when Kachuk had that incident in the Leafs game where, you know, he was basically left all alone to deal with the Leafs at that point. Now, like, anybody touches any flame and instantly one or two or three guys are right there saying, hey, what what are you doing? You know, and, like, they're right there stepping up and defending their teammates. And it doesn't matter if it's somebody poking Markstrom or like uh, what happened with Giordano cross-checking Backlund, you know, like everybody like rushed right over and is like, hey, that's not cool, and you know, uh, stood up for Backlund there, and you know, it's one of those things like just that level of difference is huge, and like especially when it comes time for the playoffs, like having that all for one, one for all mentality. You know, like, that's where Calgary becomes one of those teams that's going to be one hell of a hard team to beat. For sure, yeah. And, you know, I think you and I talked before the season about putting the C on Lucic. I think we've seen Lucic do some of those captain roles both on and off the ice without officially being that guy. But, you know, I I think it is letting – and there's a lot of things the captain does behind the scenes both – you know, in the rink and away from the rink and for the community. And I think it's letting a lot of guys well, step into you, some of those roles yeah, and, and see who can do this. Yeah. And you've seen, say, like a guy like Rasmus Anderson step up a bit. You've seen Backlund step up a bit. You've seen Kachuk step up a bit. Monahan step up a bit. You know, and it's not just one guy. And I think that in a way it's paying dividends because everybody is developing that side of their overall game as well and and, you know even when you know Tyler DeFoley was interviewed when he first got here about who is the first guy to reach out to you I mean you know usually that's the captain's job and I feel like now you've got multiple guys trying to fill those roles who know him or you know guys who just want to you know are excited to have him and I I think like you said it's sort of a one for all mentality together this team is going to conquer this year and and maybe not having that one leader that one voice is the way to go. Yeah, because everybody is accountable to the guy to the right of them and to the guy to the left of them. Well, I think that still happens if you have a captain. Oh, I know, but even more so because of the fact that, like, everybody is buying into the system and, you know, like, everybody is the captain, so to speak, and, yeah. I think think the issue here is the three the three guys who have the most Stanley Cup experience are the three guys who are playing at the bottom of the lineup. And... I think, really, if you're going to put a C on somebody, it's got to be Lou Cheech or Lewis, really, if you're looking at that kind of grizzled veteran guy. Um, but I don't think that Lewis is captain material. Maybe Lou Cheech, but it's also hard to have your captain sitting in the box for, you know, a lot of the game sometimes. So I yeah. think it just makes sense that, you know, they can do some of those things in the room. And we've heard a lot of what's going on in the room from those veteran guys. I mean, even Toffoli, you know, a fairly veteran guy coming in. But... Um, yeah, I, I don't think you need that that one C this year. Yeah, I think you need it next year. I think somebody has to emerge the leader, whether on this roster now or not. I I think you need to put a C on somebody next year. But I think this is kind of the show us you can be captain year. Yeah, I agree. And I'm not sold that it always has to be your best player either. No. Uh, my evolving prediction on that would actually be Raz. Interesting. Yeah. Rasmus Anderson. And, I mean, a young guy, but, yeah, a guy who I think the teams uh, rallied behind. 
Yeah, and he he certainly elevated his game this season, and is emerging as a top defenseman, both on the team and in the league. So, yeah, I could see you know, especially with his personality, mm-hmm. I could see. Depending on what happens in the next year, I could also see one of the A's going to the newest flame, Tyler Toffoli, next year. Yep, I I agree. Well, Matt, I think that pretty much wraps up this week. Um, We're going to have some discussion on NHL awards, but let's wait until next week to do that. And let's look ahead to – we've already done a little bit, but let's look ahead to this week and what the Flames have on their plate. We made some predictions last week. You're finally beating me in the prediction game. Like, after nine seasons, you're finally ahead. It it takes me a while to figure things out, but then when I do, I'm good. (laughs) Slow and steady wins the race. Exactly. Last week, I thought that we would win Columbus and Seattle, lose Anaheim. You thought we'd get all three, so that's your fourth win of the season. Um, and, yeah, you're beating me 4 nothing at this point. So, Matt, what do you think for this week? Do the Flames get three wins? They beat Winnipeg. They beat Vancouver. And they shut out the Minnesota Wild. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're going with an 11-game win streak after this week. Yep. 12. That's true. Yeah, it would be 12 because they're at nine now. So. Yeah. Um, and this is an interesting week. Like, it's it's the last of their homestand, but I don't actually classify this Vancouver game much of a road game. Like, they've got a day on either side. I think the team plans to leave that night from Vancouver. Like, this is not much of a, a road swing. Yeah, it's, you know, air quote road trip. You know, like, yes, but not really. It's an 8 p.m. Thursday game, which is the only weird part. If it was a 7 o'clock, you could get home a lot earlier, but you could even leave Calgary that morning, play the game, come back to Calgary that night. It's not much of a one-game road trip. Yeah, it's odd this, uh, like, through March. Like, you have this uh, one-game road trip to Vancouver, then you have a one-game road trip to Minnesota, then a one-game road trip to Colorado, then another one-game road road trip to Colorado then another one game road trip to Vancouver and it's like okay cool that's none of them are very far particularly like Minnesota is a little bit but not yeah Minnesota Colorado you won't be in your bed that night yeah but like even then they're not really annoying and, and you're not doing a lot of time change which I think the biggest part of a road trip yeah exactly only the Minnesota games a time change and uh, even that's what an hour or Vancouver too, but you know, like it, it's not. I that mean, big yeah, a deal. Vancouver's an hour. You're not like going to the East Coast. Yeah, exactly. And and like, with the Vancouver games all being eight o'clock games in their rink, that's really a seven o'clock Calgary time. So it probably doesn't feel that much different. Yeah, and even then, it's, or I guess it is eight o'clock Calgary time. Never mind. Yeah, it's one but of those things then, that, like, even with the road trips, like, there's a day off after. Uh, so like the or two and uh, so like it's not like they have to immediately turn around come back here and then play again like they have a full day off and then they play at, so. at least one day after each one of them yeah like the the first uh, two game road trip or more is actually in the, the second week or first week of April when they go on a California plus Seattle trip which big deal My prediction for this week, I think we lose Winnipeg, or sorry, we win Winnipeg, we win Vancouver, and I'm going to say that we lose against Minnesota. I think the win streak will come to an end uh, in the Saddle Dome on the 26th against Minnesota. I could agree with that. I'm going with the all the way, though, just because I I think they'll lose one of those Minnesota games and they'll win one. Should I just pencil you in for wins all the way to Tampa Bay and think that we're going to tie this record? Pretty much, you know, like if they actually do pull off the twelve, you know, I'm going to go fifteen because I'll, of I'll just I'll just put you down for wins for the rest of the season. As long as they keep actually doing it, yeah, please do. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll do some paperwork tonight and I'll get yeah. this all set up. Yeah, you know, um, we'll talk like when they actually do lose, but then yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it'll be, I think it's going to be a good week. Like you said, I think Winnipeg's an opponent that we need to give more credit to. I think, like Seattle, they've, they're a team that's given us a hard time, and I'm going to be curious to see how the Flames play them. Yeah. Like, um, honestly, would I be shocked if they lose to Winnipeg? Absolutely not. But especially with 2 p.m. start, like they never, the Flames never do well with matinees. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, we never do well with the Family Day game. 
Yeah. So, like, I would absolutely not be shocked at all if it stops at 9. But, you know, then I would still expect them to beat Vancouver and Minnesota just because, you know, getting right back on that horse. So last year, the family day game, Calgary won 4-3 to three in overtime against Vancouver. I don't, doesn't really matter in 2020 because the times were all weird when we were in that season. 2019, Calgary won 5 to, no, uh, yeah, Calgary won 5-2 against Arizona. So, okay, we're not doing as bad in that game as I thought we usually were. That's weird. Must be an aberration them winning the last two because I, I, had that same inclination in my thoughts as well. So, yeah. Weird. Yeah, it, it'll be it'll be a good game to see. I think really though, the interesting one's going to be the Vancouver game. And Vancouver's on a bit of a slump, but I can also see Vancouver I can see Vancouver being a tougher opponent than the Flames are going to give him credit for. Well, and that's where like it'll be interesting to see how Daryl can get them to reset. Uh, you know, like especially you know, like frankly, the that Seattle game was perfectly timed, and the manner in which that game was was perfectly timed because you know Calgary kind of took them a little easy, you know, and it's one of those where you know, and deservedly so because Seattle's terrible, but you know, like they can't do that against Winnipeg, and they can't do that against Vancouver and expect two points. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how Daryl can get them to reset, to refocus, and, you know, actually hit those open nets when they actually do come. <laughs> and I think, too, you know, we talked about it as well. I think the Flames haven't played a really good 60-minute effort. I'd say this whole homestand. I think to beat Winnipeg and Minnesota, you're going to need to put in a good 60. I don't think they can come out in the first like they have been this week. Yeah, pretty much only the Vegas game, I'd say, was a full 60 minutes. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's fair. But, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, like, every game is just... It's going to be interesting just both for itself and in context of everything else. And hopefully the Flames can just keep rolling for a bit more just to build up a little bit more of a buffer on Vegas, frankly. And... The more space that we get on them, the better. Do you think that we see uh, Dan Vladar in net this week? Uh, probably the Vancouver game, just because Vancouver is probably the easiest opponent of the four or three. Uh, yeah. Because they do have to manage Markstrom's ice time a bit. Like, you know, like I would expect, frankly, uh, the... Vancouver game, the Montreal game to both be Vladar and probably the Detroit game the following week. Wow, he's going to get some more home starts. Yeah. Then, like, after, you know, like, frankly, after the March 13th game against Colorado, uh, like, all, basically all of the teams the Flames play through the end of the month, other than Colorado, again, are all mediocre to bad. So you can kind of throw Vladar in at your leisure whenever it makes sense. And we'll talk about this when we get past the deadline and we talk about the rest of the season, but I think at some point we have to ask, do we see Dustin Wolf in that? Yeah. Well, I, I would expect uh, the Flames to play Wolf in one of the last three games on the road at the end of the season if they've already kind of clinched everything. Do you and scratch can't... Markstrom in that game and run your, your tandem as Vladar Wolf? Boy. Um, and Matt, the last thing that we're going to bring up this week, having our predictions now locked in, is just letting people know that we had a scheduling change for this month. We moved from Wednesday recordings to Sunday recordings with the intent of going back to Wednesday recordings come March. But we've looked at the schedule and it's going to work out better for us to stay recording on Sundays. So through the rest of the season, we will continue to do Sunday recordings, which means you should get the show um, appearing in your feed or however you get our podcast uh, on Mondays instead of going back to the Thursday time. So just so everyone's aware, we'll be sticking with the same schedule that you're listening to us right now. Yeah, it, it's one of those things. COVID uh, kind of throws plans out the window for some reason. So, you know. <laughs> As always, if you want to give us your thoughts on what we've talked about, where the flames are or anything, uh, get a hold of us on social media. On Twitter, we're at Fireside Podcast, Facebook.com slash Fireside Podcast if you want to use that. 
You can go to our website, firesidechat.ca, and send us an email or leave us a voicemail. There's a way to do that from there as well. Those are all the best ways to get a hold of us if you want to chat with us. And we will see everybody next week. Yep, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.